بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين. So we're continuing from where we left off last day, and we were on verse fifty-one of Surah Ahzab. The verse before spoke about the allowances that were given to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم regarding his marriages with the different wives. And in Surah Hazab, verse 51, it goes on to say, You, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can postpone, can postpone the turn of whom you will of them, that's your wives, and you may receive whom you will, and whomsoever you desire of those whom you have set aside her turn temporarily, it is no sin on you to receive her again, that is better that they may be comforted and not grieved and may all be pleased with what you give them. Allah knows what is in your hearts and Allah is ever all-knowing, most forbearing. So this verse of the Holy Quran, like the other verses, it continues to mention the concessions and allowances that were granted to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet of Allah, the most beloved of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not put certain restrictions and limitations on him, but Allah granted him many different allowances on account of which his task and mission of reaching the message of Allah to mankind became easy. So as it is mentioned here, it states here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is granted the option to appoint a turn. That's a time for a wife or to exclude her from it. The normal rule regarding a Muslim who has more than one wife is that he must divide his time in a manner that he is just and fair in distributing his time for each wife. This is the well-established rule of the Holy Quran and is compulsory upon the believers. However, the Prophet ﷺ was informed by Allah in this verse that he was exempted from this and that he had the option and liberty to distribute his time as he desired. So two things that we must recognize there is that whenever a person has more than one wife, then it is forced and compulsory upon him to share his time equally. He must, not, he must not be more inclined and he must not lean to one with respect to the time more than the other one. That, that brings about a terrible punishment. One of the conditions that is set for a man to marry to more than one wife is that he is able to deal justly with them in every aspect with respect to maintenance, with respect to place of staying for the woman, with respect to looking after her needs, with respect to spending the time, and whatever time that is spent by one must be the same time spent by the other. That is the law that is for us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had more than one wife at one time, and he used to spend his time equally also. So if he had four, then obviously he will spend equal time with each. He had more than that seven. Based upon the allowance that Allah has given to him, he will spend time in accordance to the amount he had, but they were equal times. Uh, you know, I mean, there was equality in the time for each person. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given to the believers and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam practiced upon that. But here in this ayah, Allah is given him Another allowance, one allowance was to marry more than four wives at one time, and that was based on the wisdom, you know, that, you know, Allah had placed for that. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him that you can postpone the turn of whom you will of them. It means that if the Prophet is being told, if you had set a time for one, you can postpone that time. It doesn't have to be that time. You don't have to give that time. So you can, if for example, if the Prophet ﷺ used to spend a certain night 
with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala this ayah made it permissible for him to remove that <clears throat> postpone it until any other time in future so like the believers how they are taken to task for not fulfilling the law of equality between the wives the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not like that <clears throat> so allah says it is allowed for you to postpone whom you will of them and you may receive whom you will and whoever you wish to keep in the turns you can keep so if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wanted to uh, you know remove the time spent from one wife and give it to another wife he was at liberty to do that he was at liberty to do that and some of the wives remember i was mentioning last week that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he married to women in order to take care of their children they were widows their husbands were martyred in the battles in the battle of badr in the battle of uhud many different battles and he used to look after them and take care of them so sometimes the wives will tell the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we give up our haq we give up our right that we have over you we give our time if you wish to spend the time with us okay if not then there's no problem we have given up our time so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is told that he can make that adjustment and if he had actually uh, postponed that of a woman and decided that he will not spend time regular with that if he wants to revoke that and start back the spending of the nights like that he can do that and that is what allah says at whomsoever you desire <coughs> the eye is coming on page 712 and whomsoever you desire of those whom you have set aside so those you have set aside and decided not to spend time with them if you wish to now begin spending time again then there is no harm upon you it is no sin on you to receive her again <clears throat> allah says that is better than they be that they may be comforted and not grieved allah says that this that you are doing it will bring ease to them and it will not cause them to grieve now as it is mentioned here in the other paragraph we from here we will understand you know the the the, the reason why such allowances and concessions were given to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam why it is that you know he was not um let's say he was not it was not compulsory upon him to follow what was given to the believers generally it says it should be noted here that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent as the final prophet and as the universal messenger to the entire mankind he was not for a community for a village for a city not even for makka or makkah and medina put together he was sent for the whole world Allah says لِتُخْرِجَ النَّاسَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ O Muhammad, you were sent to take out the whole of mankind from darkness. That was your job. But in the case of other prophets, when Allah spoke to the other prophets, Allah says, You have been sent لِتُخْرِجَ قَوْمَكَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ To take out your people alone. As for the other people, Allah will send a prophet there. You concentrate on your people. So therefore, you will find that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus when he came, he clearly said even the, the script, you know, the scriptures that are still, you know, to some extent, it's there. His statement is still there. I have not been sent to anyone except to the lost sheep. of the house of israel i'm sent only to these people the israelites nobody else i have not been sent to the jews and the gentiles he clearly said that the people will follow him he says i've been i've not been sent to you so his job was to take over from musa alayhi salam and musa alayhi salam was sent to take out the israelites from the bondage of pharaoh and carry them to the promised land 
So, all the prophets, Zakaria alayhi salam came, Zakaria alayhi salam came to just to tell the people that Prophet Isa is coming, Jesus is coming. Yeah. And so, in the past, you will find that uh, at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah sent him to Philistine. So, when Allah carried him to build the Kaaba in Hijaz, Allah did not make him live there. He, we know this history. He told his son Ismail to live there and the wife Hajra to live there. But where is Ibrahim going to go back to Philistine? Because he was commissioned by Allah to propagate the religion in Palestine. He had a nephew by the name of Lut alayhi salam. Lut alayhi salam was not sent to Philistine because Allah sent Ibrahim there. So he sent Lut alayhi salam to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and three other cities besides close by. Okay. Then is Ibrahim had another son by the name of Ishaq. Ishaq was sent in a different place. And Ismail was the prophet there, you know, in the land of Hijaz, which is, became Makkah and Medina. Hijaz was always the name from the very beginning. So we see here, whenever a prophet was sent to a village, like, you know, if a prophet is sent to this area, if a prophet is sent to a city, before the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, no one was a universal prophet. Subhanallah. Just imagine that. That is the great honor. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not a single prophet was a universal prophet. Everyone was sent only to their community. And Allah mentioned that to them in the Quran. You have been sent to take out your people from darkness. Their worry is not about other people. Allah will take care of the other people. He will send a messenger. He will send somebody. And it's for this reason we find that many prophets existed at the same time, one time, but to different places, villages and cities. Many of them. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was self sent for the whole human race, but not only the human race. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Nabi of Thakalain. He was the Nabi sent for the two species of beings that account, are accountable to Allah. Judgment will take place on them. These are the ones who will be sent to paradise and hell. Who they are? Men and jinn. These are the two beings that are accountable to Allah for their deeds. And it is compulsory for them to bring faith in Allah. Besides that, angels are created for a job and a task. They are not mukallaf of the sharia. They work for Allah. Allah created them for that. So they do not have to follow teachers like how you and I follow. Allah made them to worship him. They are doing that. An angel can't commit a sin. Allah has not made it in an angel to even think about a sin. An angel is created from light, pure Angel is not a male or female. Angels don't have the need to eat or drink, to marry, to have children. They are pure beings only created for the worship of Allah. Nothing else. Animals have no accounting to do with Allah. Anything you see, they have except men and jinn. This is why prophets was, the Prophet ﷺ was sent to the jinnats also. And it's compulsory upon the jinnats to believe in him and believe in Allah. Okay, so therefore, <clears throat> it means that the Prophet ﷺ was not sent to the entire human race, in being a universal prophet to only men, but to jinnats also. So his mission was far above the mission of any single prophet. And that is a very great mansab and status of the Prophet ﷺ. He was the vessel through which Allah brought guidance on the face of the earth. And his task was to establish the religion among men and jinn. His days and nights, along with the moments of his life, was spent in the propagation of Allah's religion. For him, there was nothing like the day to work and the night to rest. Day and night he will be behind the deen. 
moving to different people, going to different people, reaching out the message, campaigns, expedition, every single thing, because his whole life was engaged in that. His whole life was like that. Owing to the great mission which he was chosen for, <clears throat> Allah did not place restriction, restrictions and limitations on him, which will obstruct him from his real duty as a messenger of Allah. Very important point. And this is what makes us understand why allowances were given to him. Because Allah gave him all the time he wanted for the deen. And for that time he had, he could not think about that there is an opportunity to go in another city and give the dawat to think about who is at home and which wife he has to spend time with and which house he must be. He does not have that time to think about that. His focus is not that. His mission is much bigger than that. His mission is the hidayat of man. That is his mission. So since he had absorbed himself fully in propagating the deen of Allah, Allah made it up to him, O oh Nabi, when you decide and how you decide, you spend the time with your wife, subhanAllah. Why? Because his objective was A'la, was the highest. And this was secondary in his life. The main purpose was to raise the banner of Islam, to reach out the kalima. It meant going out to defend Islam, to fight the battles. And that is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his life was totally different. Even before he died, he says, we the Ambiyas don't leave anything behind to be inherited. We don't leave anything behind. Nothing of his was left in inheritance. Nothing. He said, we do not come to pile up gold and silver. He said clearly, I have not been sent to work. Work and earn a livelihood and a daily bread and work in the farms. No. I have been sent as a teacher to mankind by Allah. That is my job. Allah will provide. He used to fast sometimes consecutively. Days after days, nights after nights, he wouldn't eat anything. Once the Sahabas tried to emulate him in fasting consecutively. He said, no, don't do that. He says, Allah nourishes me. Allah nourishes me. So I am fasting, but Allah is taking care of me. He will go out for the whole day, on the horse, in the field, but yet stand up the whole night. That's strength. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith recorded in Bukhari said, the Prophet of Allah was given the strength of 40 human beings. 40. So strong he was. Allah made him for the mission he was chosen to do. He needed that stamina, he needed that energy, he needed that strength, he needed that bravery, he needed the courage to face everything that came his way. And we know very well, everything came in his way. Every single thing you can think about. So Allah made him a pillar of steadfastness, strong like the mountain, rooted in the ground. Nothing could have moved him from that mission. What did he say to his uncle? He said, oh my uncle, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my right left hand and they ask me to give up this mission, I will never, never give it up until Allah decides my case. So therefore, <clears throat> higher objectives, that it was, it was about. Higher objectives, understanding what he was to do on the face of the earth. So therefore, all the other things, it just fell by the side in the sense that he will turn to it and take care of it when the objectives were fulfilled. So he was a family man because Allah sent him as a role model to the human being and Allah ordered us as human beings to follow him. He is the most perfect example. So with all the allowances, he knew that he had to leave an example for his followers to follow. So he did it and he fulfilled the rights other people had upon him from his wives, from his children, from the community people, from the aunts and the uncles, he fulfilled it. He provided for. He became the ideal role model. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not place such laws on him that will affect 
the mission that he has come to accomplish. Hence the special allowances granted to him <coughs> are for the sake of removing difficulties and to give him the entire time to dedicate towards the religion of Allah. If you have a person who is working for you and your company is in trouble and you want him to turn over the company fast, he may come to you and say, I can do it. But don't tell me what time I can come and what time I will leave. Leave it up to me. I will spin this whole thing, but give me the liberty to do it. Don't put time upon my head. Don't put rules upon me. Give me my time, I'll do it. And you will see sometimes that person working night in and he finishes far before he's supposed to finish. So therefore, it's just for us to understand that when you need somebody to do something which must be done, you give him allowances and concessions that other people may not get. The Prophet ﷺ was granted that because of the task he was supposed to perform. As such, in verse 51, Allah granted him the option to fix the times or turns for his wives in the manner he wanted. Allah says, it's up to you. If you want to spend two nights with one, two days with one, and then one with the other one, or if you do not want to spend any because of the task and what you have to do, O oh Prophet, it's up to you. You do as you wish. Because that will come from Allah when, the, when Allah knows the Prophet inside out. That it's not that a person gets an allowance and he takes advantage of that. And then because of that allowance he is given, he starts to be unfair and unjust. That will never happen from the Prophet As we, we read last week, Allah is saying to the Prophet, those women with whom you want to marry, without giving a dawah, it's allowed for you to do that. But yet the Prophet gave every one of his wife a dowry. <clears throat> So he was exempted from that, but he didn't exercise that. He gave them the dowry. He gave them. In this option, he was allowed to appoint a time for a wife and was also allowed to exclude her or delay her from a turn. So if a time was coming up, he can postpone that for another time. He can do that. It was allowed for him to reappoint a turn for a wife whom he had previously excluded from the division of his time. So from among the wives, if he had stopped going to someone, you know, to fulfill a time there, and he wishes now to take, you know, to give her back that time to go to her, then it was, you know, that was an option given to him. He can do that. The verse goes further to state that this allowance given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in reality a comfort for the wives. As Allah says, that is better that they may be comforted and not grieved and may all be pleased with what you give them. Allah says that in the Quran. This that Allah is saying to him, you can, you know, postpone the turn, you can fix the turn, you know, and, 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 and take it and give it when you want. That is so that will make it, it will make it easy for them. <clears throat> and that is what is mentioned here. As it says, the verse goes further to state that this allowance given to the Prophet ﷺ was in reality a comfort for the wives, since through this they became aware that Allah has not made it mandatory upon the Prophet ﷺ to appoint or fix a turn for any one of them. Therefore, whatever time and turn they got from the Prophet wasallam, they became extremely happy and were pleased with it. It is about this, Allah says, that is better that they may be comforted and not grieved and may be pleased with what you give them. In the beginning, obviously, they thought to themselves that they, they, it's their haq and their right and they could demand the time from the Prophet wasallam. So, if the time passed and he did not come, they will be grieved because they will be looking ahead for his coming. And some of them, some of them who never used to get that turn used to think that prob probably the Prophet wasallam, for some reason is not coming. Probably he does not enjoy their company or so. But with this ayah, 
and this uh, uh, allowance that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given by Allah, all the wives realized two things: one, no time Allah has fixed on him, so they can't demand that time. That's one. So it puts them at rest now. It puts them easy. As against before, you are worried. You know, the mind, it's filled. If the Prophet is not coming on the day he said he will come, so many things are going through. Did I do anything to displease him? Why is he not coming? Did somebody say something to him? Does he want to divorce me? But when they know that Allah did not make it compulsory, then all these things will not come and only one thing will come. Allah did not make it compulsory on him, so it is up to him. No other thoughts will come. Will he divorce me? Does he enjoy my company? All these things. Okay? Because they know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his task was something that he needed time for. But yet with all of that, he used to spend time, you know, with all the family members. That's the first thing. They understood that Allah did not make it compulsory upon him to divide his time equally and to give any one of them a time that they can demand from him. That was the haq. And the other thing is that they will know that whatever time the Prophet ﷺ decided to choose for them, they would know that subhanallah, the Prophet ﷺ has decided to come to them and that will make them happy. He has chosen to spend the time with, with them. It's not of a compulsory nature. So when they know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is coming uh, Thursday night and another one says the Prophet will come on a Friday and the other one knows the Prophet will come on a Saturday. This used to make them happy. This used to make them happy when he fixed the turns for them. Even if he postponed the turns, then they will also become happy because they will just not be waiting indefinitely, hoping, 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 and sometimes the Prophet may not come, and then they become worried. So when something is fixed by him, based upon the allowance that Allah had given to him, that makes them in a better state, puts them in a better state of mind, and then also knowing that Allah did not make anything a com compulsory upon him, that will also make it easy for them to understand that nothing is compulsory upon him. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is given that option. So because of this, Allah himself says, O oh Prophet, this allowance I'm giving you, it will bring more comfort to your wives. SubhanAllah. It will bring more comfort to your wife. And that is better for them. <clears throat> At the end of the verse, Allah says, the Quran says, the ayah says, Allah knows what is in your hearts and Allah is ever all-knowing, most forbearing. Here Allah tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he is fully aware of what is in his heart and in the heart of every person. Allah has full knowledge of every thought and intention that enters the heart. He knows the direction in which the heart turns to and has full knowledge of who is more beloved to the Prophet ﷺ from his wives. He also <coughs> has full knowledge of what is in the hearts of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ <coughs> and that of the believers. In all cases, Allah is most forbearing. So, this ayah is connected. The ayah concludes. The ayat also, the verse always concludes with a very, very beautiful lesson that is attached to uh, the, the things that took place in the ayah or the things that happened on account of which the verse was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this allowance to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about it's not compulsory upon him with respect to the time and he can fix the time as he chooses. Now, before that, the Quran said, the ayah closes by saying, Allah knows what is in the hearts. Two things. Allah knew exactly on one hand that the Prophet wasallam at times used to be inclined to spend more time at a certain wife because of the fact that he will use her as a means of propagating the deen of Allah above the others. 
One such wife was like Aisha, and this is why Allah made that marriage between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Aisha. In fact, that marriage, Jibreel Alayhi Salam came and told the Prophet that Allah, Allah has contracted your marriage, or Allah has given you and will give you the marriage, you know, Aisha in your marriage. Because among all the wives, I want you to look at the books of a hadith and see which wife has narrated the most amount of hadith. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala Allah used her to be such a great scholar of Islam that sahabas, the male sahabas used to come and learn from her her father Abu Bakr used to come and learn from her she is the one that expounded and explained the life of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa she she was young she was brilliant she was intelligent she was full of energy and she was quick, quick to grasp everything the Prophet said. Obviously, a young person, the memory, the ability and the retention is more powerful than all the people. The Quran, subhanAllah, she was the greatest faqih in Medina, greatest scholar. Thousands of ahadith she narrated. She did, not under, she did not only learn a hadith, she understood the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That when there are a hadith that seem to be opposing, she knew exactly how to fit each in its place like a puzzle, so none remains opposing. opposing. Because she knew his life. If somebody says the Prophet said that, she will tell them why he said that and to whom he said that. And if something somebody else narrated the opposite, she will tell them why he said that at that time. Where he was at that time. Aisha was the greatest faqih. She was very intelligent. Sometimes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say something. She will ask a question, she will question him. Not his authority and not what he's saying to be true or not. But to try to understand deeply the message contained in what he is saying. <clears throat> Once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O oh Aisha, whoever's reckoning is taken, he is doomed. Whoever his hisab and his reckoning is taken by Allah, he's doomed, he's destroyed. When she heard that, everybody will hear it, they will learn it. She said, but O oh Prophet of Allah, didn't Allah say in the Quran that he will give the believers an easy reckoning? So how would that person be doomed if Allah says he will get an easy reckoning? So on one hand Allah says the believers, they will have hisab and yasira, easy reckoning. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O oh Aisha, hisab and yasira, it means that Allah will call a servant on the day of judgment will remind the servant of the misdeeds he did and then Allah will say, O oh, my servant, you committed these sins, I conceal them on the face of the earth, I will conceal them today and I forgive you, go to Jannah. This is called Al-Aruz. Allah will just place his record in front of him, Allah will not take him to task at all. He says, but O Aisha, whenever and when Allah begins to question a man, he will be doomed. Who would have all the answers for the questions he will be asked? Even in our life, in this world, if a person begins to ask us questions of, for everything we did on this day today, we can't answer all of that. We will sweat. The person, the Prophet says, who's, when Allah begins the question, he will tremble like a leaf. Can't answer. Can't explain to Allah why he did this and why he did that. So anyhow, so that's the first point, not to move away from what we are speaking about. One is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as I said, his mission was deen. That's his, that was his task, nothing else. That was his objective. Objective. During the whole day, he will propagate deen and at night he will pray for its success. The night was ibadat, the day was dawat. Ibadat and dawat, propagation and ibadat. So when he spent more time, then Aisha used to learn. And that was the channel through which the deen reached the woman on the face of the earth. About, you know, the, the laws regarding a woman. What she ought to do at this time about her own self. You know, there are different laws. 
So on one hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to be naturally sometimes inclined to one above others. And on the other hand, some of those wives who used to get less time or their time used to be postponed, they used to have that in their heart. Why is that so? So when Allah says, when it says Allah knows what is in your hearts, he is speaking to the wives also, I know what is in your hearts, you can't hide that. And he's also speaking to the prophet, I know what is in your heart, O prophet. I know. I know you have a natural inclination to some above the others. <coughs> so Allah will give you such an allowance that you wouldn't have to feel guilty of anything. You will have full liberty that yes, the intention you have for doing that is correct and it is sound. So you have that allowance. You want to spend more time with one or less time with another one? Then you have the liberty and the option to do that. And as for the wives, Allah is telling them indirectly and also directly, remove those thoughts you have in your heart about the Rasul of Allah. There is nothing like that. In fact, he is at total liberty to either spend time with you or not. So you should feel happy when he spends a day or two with you. You should appreciate that. And that is why that ayat ends with this. Allah knows what is in your hearts. Referring to both sides. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and also what? You know, um, the other. So he knows, so Allah is all-knowing. He knows what is in your hearts because he knows everything. He's all-knowing. He's Al-Khabir, al alim And the one who has full knowledge, then what you have in your hearts can't escape him. He's called the all-knowing because he knows what you have in your hearts. So Allah knows what is in your hearts and he is, Allah is most forbearing. So it's connected. Now, he, it's connected that he knows what is in your hearts and some of these things might not be good. But he wouldn't penalize you for that. You know why? He's forbearing. He will wait until you change yourself. He forbears that. You know, sometimes with all of us, Allah knows that there is good in us even when we commit sins. So he doesn't take us to task. He says he will change. He will change. And this, subhanallah, is such a beautiful sifat that the angels have been commanded also to follow suit in the same manner. That when a believer commits a sin, the angels... The angel who is deputed to write that sin is told, wait, don't write anything. Perhaps he may do a good deed. The good deed will wash away the bad deed and you wouldn't have the chance to write and record because what is recorded will show up on the day of judgment. So the best thing is we should try for it not to be written. For it not to be written. That's the first thing. This is why Allah is so kind and merciful. He orders that angel not to write. If the person doesn't do any good deed to wash it away, and the angel writes, he says, just write one sin for that wrongdoing. On the other hand, when a man just has an intention to do something good, Allah orders the angel, write a blessing for him. Just only an intention, he has done nothing yet. And if the man does good, his blessing starts from 10, not from 1. I mean, fear is fate, supposed to start at 1. Isn't that so? But it starts at 10. That is how kind and merciful Allah is. So the point is, Allah is forbearing. He knows what he, the believers have, in, and He's most forbearing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned if people commit sins, they will be punished. So Allah sees the believers committing sins. He sees what they have in their hearts. But yet, he will give them a chance. He'll keep on giving them a chance. He will say they will change. They will make tawbah. They will change. And that brings, that is because of the quality of helm, forbearance. Allah is forbearing. So, as it states here, his comprehensive and perfect knowledge 
makes him aware of all that is made manifest through the tongue's actions or what is kept hidden in the corners of the heart. He has comprehensive knowledge. Everything the servant utters, good or bad, Allah knows it. Everything the man intends, good or bad, Allah knows it. Everything the man does physically, that, is, might, be, that might be really, really haram and unlawful, totally haram, Allah also sees that and Allah knows that. But with all of that sometimes, most of the times, Allah does not take the man to task. The man lives, commits sins every day and he lives. 80, 90 years, wealth, prosperity, goodness, good health, everything at his services and Allah looks at him committing sins. Allah is forbearing. He gives him the chance. He gives him the chance, hoping that he will change himself one day. But if the man doesn't change, then and he dies in that state, the penalty and punishment is very severe because Allah gave him a lot of years to change himself and he didn't use it to his advantage. That is why the punishment will be so severe for such a person because he got the chance to better himself and still he did not better himself. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has perfect knowledge. His perfect attribute of forbearance brings about tolerance and leniency. And so, he puts matters in their proper places and in a good order for the benefit of his servant. So, what it means? It means that Allah, he sees, he hears, he knows. But he's so fair, forbearing, he tolerates, subhanallah. He tolerates. He tolerates. I mean, we can understand even human beings, how they tolerate. Parents, they tolerate their children. The children do a wrong, they come back. Parents give them a chance. All the other brothers and sisters say, why don't kick him out from the house? He's so wicked. Why don't do this, dad? Why don't do that, mom? Look how he's ill-treating you. But tolerance. Why? Because of compassion. So one leads. So therefore, it makes that person forbear. And Allah is not only compassionate, he is Arhamur Rahimin, the most compassionate of those who show compassion to others. So when human beings can be so tolerant, Allah also is tolerant. So his quality and sifat of forbearance brings about tolerance. Leniency, he's lenient. He's lenient. Even though the servant commits sins and Allah can punish him, the servant falls into trouble at that moment. And then in that trouble, he makes the one say, Oh Allah, I need your help. Even in that state, Allah helps him. Just imagine that. So lenient Allah is. So soft. In other words, the servant entitles and is deserving of punishment for his wrongdoings. He falls into a difficulty, which means he, because of what he has done, He's not supposed to be held because he has really wronged his master. He has committed sins. But yet in that case, Allah accepts his do and say, My servant, what are you asking for? Allah gives it to him. All of these things, given the chance to the believer so that he may change his life in, and put it in the right direction. <clears throat> Although he knows of the undesirable thoughts of the hearts, he does not make, make haste in punishment. Instead, he delays and he grants respite. That is Allah. With respect to the allowance granted to the Prophet wasallam to include or exclude a wife from his time, it should be understood that the Prophet wasallam always maintained equality among his wives and did not practice upon the allowance granted to him, as I mentioned to you. Allah gave him a great amount of allowances and concessions, but he maintained equality. He was just, he was fair. He divided his time among all wives with fairness and was equally just to all. Even when undertaking a journey, he will not select one of his wives at random based on his personal desire. Instead, he will draw lots to decide who he will accompany him to be fair to all. Lest one say that, oh, you like her more, you like, no. He tried to be just, put all their names 
in, in small pieces of paper or what and then mixed up and then took it. he used to take out a name whosoever's name and then on journey the amount of time he spent with any particular wife when he comes back he will spend that amount of time with the other wives he always was equal and fair he was fair although Allah excused him ex ex exempted him he was so fair with everyone Regarding the Prophet's fair distribution of time to his wives, it is narrated in a tradition from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala that she said, the Messenger of Allah used to maintain equality among all wives and used to supplicate to Allah, O oh Allah, this is my division in what I am able to do. So do not call me to account in that which I have no control. You know, is he saying to Allah, O oh Allah, what I am doing is what is humanly possible for me. But if I err in any matter, if it ever happens that my heart leans to have more love for one, oh Allah, my heart is in your hand. I can't control my heart. I may control my body, my physical emotions, but the heart I can't control. So if, although I am maintaining equality and fairness with everyone, if the heart tends to love any wife more, oh Allah, please excuse me and don't take me to task for that. Because obviously the heart is in the hands of Allah. Nobody has control over his heart. Surah Zab goes further in verse 52 and states, It is not lawful for you to marry other women after this, nor to change them for other wives, even though their beauty attracts you, except those captives or slaves, whom your right hand possesses, and Allah is ever a watcher over all things. So at this juncture here, remember these verses came at different times, and it came at a time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam already had seven wives. They were all in his contract. And all the rules and regulations that were given with respect, respect to equality, all these things were fulfilled. Now Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells him, now it is not lawful for you to marry women after this. After now, that's one commentary. After this time Allah is saying, at that point in time, it is not permissible for you to marry others, nor to change them for other wives, nor is it allowed for you to divorce one and take another one in, in her place. Even though the beauty of others may attract you, a woman may be pious, she will have fantastic ikhlaq. As a prophet, you may think, you may say, this is a good woman who can be used as a channel and a vessel to reach out deen to the communities. And the Prophet sallallahu is to look, when one wife, he got married to one wife, on account of marrying that one wife, 100 people from her tribe accepted Islam. The Prophet ﷺ used to see, had deep insight. He used to look far for benefit to the deen, not for himself. You know, what good can come out of this? So Allah is saying, even though they may appeal to you, but oh Prophet, it is not allowed for you. Except those captives or slaves that come, then they are not free women, then yes, you can have them in your act, your contract of marriage. And Allah is ever a watcher over all things. According to some commentators, this verse instructed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that besides the wives he had in the contract of marriage at this specific time, it was not allowed for him to marry other women. This is the first explanation that at this point in time when this ayah was revealed, those who were already in his contract, they were there. He was not allowed to marry any other person. It was also <clears throat> not permissible for him to change any one of them by divorcing one and marrying a new wife. As mentioned by some commentators, this restriction was in appreciation to those wives of the Prophet wasallam who were pleased to choose Allah and His Messenger the life hereafter when they were given the choice to make. This ayah was revealed <clears throat> in order to recognize the great sacrifices the wives who were in His contract, they made for Islam and they made for Allah and His Rasul wasallam. Why? Because they had gone through a lot of different difficulties going through the hardships of migration, being persecuted, being mocked at. And with all of that, when Allah revealed the Prophet, we have read that where he was asked to give them a choice. Oh wives, do you wish Allah and his Rasul or do you wish this world? If you wish this world, then come, I will give you the worldly benefit and divorce you. 
But if you wish Allah and His Rasul and you accept the poverty and straitened situations you are in, then choose that. Where after placing that choice in front of them, all of them accepted to be with the Rasul of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah is honoring them in this ayah. And it's as if he's telling the Prophet, O Prophet, these wives are so great in the sight of Allah. Just keep them as your wives and no one else. Subhanallah. Their status in Allah, with Allah is so high. It should not happen that because of anything, one of them is divorced and then they miss the opportunity of being your wife in the hereafter in Jannah. And it should not happen that what Allah has given to them as being wives, that others who may now come, and they did not go through all those hardships and sacrifices, that they will also share in that great opportunity to be a mother of the believers and be a wife in Jannah. So it is in goodness to them. It is recognizing their goodness, their status, and appreciation to them. <clears throat> Allah is saying to the Prophet, O Prophet of Allah, these wives are very dear to you. They are very great in the sight of Allah. Keep them, don't change them, and don't take anybody else. As the commentators have stated, that that was the reason. So Allah was pleased with them and is pleased with their being in marriage of the Prophet. ﷺ. Remember, the Rasul was chosen by Allah. His wives also had to be chosen by Allah, isn't that so? They are his companions on the face of the earth and will be his companions, wives in Jannah also. Allah disallowed, hence Allah disallowed the Prophet from marrying other women besides them, as is mentioned in Tafsir ibn Kathir. Some commentators have explained that the verse informs the Prophet that he was not allowed to marry other women besides the times which have been allowed in the verses before. You know, in the verse before, which we have, you know, uh, read, there was that ayah, verse 50, which stated, O Prophet, verily we have uh, made lawful to you your wives to whom you have paid their mahar, and those captives whom your right hand possesses, and the daughters of your paternal uncles, and the daughters of your paternal aunts and the daughters of your maternal uncles and the daughters of your maternal aunts who migrated from Makkah with you. And then it goes on to say, and a believing woman, if she offers herself to the Prophet and the Prophet wishes to marry her, then it is allowed to marry her without giving her dowry. And this is a privilege for you only, not for the rest of believers. So therefore, some commentators say, say they say that in this ayah, Allah specified the categories of women with whom he can contract a marriage. Okay? In verse 50. So this here, which is being stated, it is not lawful for you. It means besides those of prophet, it is not allowed for you to marry others. But if you have to marry, it must be within those categories that have been allowed. Okay? And there is a reward. <coughs> there is a reward. And a narration from Aisha, which is authentic. You know, many, many of the commentators and Mufassirin have also accepted this. That it doesn't mean generally it's not allowed at all for him to marry anybody. But it just meant that besides the categories described here and mentioned, others besides them are not allowed. And that, that, uh, that is uh, also evident because of that riwayat of Aisha, where Aisha radiallahu ta'ala said, <coughs> the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, <coughs> did not die until Allah made halal for him anyone he wished to marry. So it means that Allah, if there was any prohibition, Allah revoked the prohibition and gave him permission again. But the Prophet ﷺ did not marry to anybody again. But I'm just showing the allowances were given as Allah's favor and blessings to him but he, knowing his status as a role model for the Ummah, and he wanted that his followers follow him, what he did, he did not practice upon those allowances and concessions. Okay? So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala said that. So therefore, some scholars and commentators have held the first opinion that it just meant generally, no, he couldn't marry again, and some took the other opinion based on the rewrite of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. Having mentioned certain matters, 
connected to the marriages of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah goes further in verse 53 to highlight some etiquettes or adab, manners, which the companions were required to adopt when they entered the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this ayah, subhanAllah, has a lot of beautiful adab, etiquettes and good manners for all Muslims. You know, about our social, you know, interaction with each other, how we live with each other, etc. For example, the ayah starts. Now, in many, many verses of the Quran, we will find there is a way that Allah mentions the verse. Sometimes Allah wants to teach us a lesson, but He addresses the Prophet, you do not do this. But like He told the Prophet, if you ever commit shirk after guidance comes to you, then you will find no one to stop Allah from punishing you. That's the mafum. But how would the Prophet commit shirk? Allah chose him to be a prophet. Allah knows his whole life. Allah knows everything about him. Allah knows what will happen to him in the... Allah will never choose somebody. But it means if your followers commit shirk after they have been guided, then they will get severe punishment from Allah. So, so to hear, obviously there is a first reason for its revelation. And there is a general teaching and understanding and lesson. So Allah says, O oh, you who believe, referring to all the believers, the Sahabas and all Muslims, enter not the Prophet's houses <coughs> except when leave or when permission is given to you for a meal. If he invites you to come and dine with him, invites you for a meal, then enter only when you are permitted to do so, not before, not after. And then not so early as to wait for its preparation. Don't go so early that you are inside waiting and the food is cooking. No. Go at a time when it is ready. So Allah says, but when you are invited, enter. When you are invited, then enter. <coughs> and when you have taken your meal, disperse. You have eaten, go. <coughs> Without sitting for a talk. Don't sit down there carrying on conversations and causing inconvenience to the Prophet and chatting and all these things. Allah says to the companions, do not do that. Verily, such behavior annoys the Prophet. And he is shy of asking you to go. The Prophet will not tell you to leave. So he's harmed. He's affected by you being there the Prophet ﷺ doesn't have time to spare for old talk as we say and for chatting and all these things. He doesn't have that time. So when others are keeping him back, subhanAllah, it will definitely affect him. So he is shy. So he wouldn't tell you to leave. Nor would he correct you and tell you what you are doing is wrong. But Allah is not shy of telling you the truth and Allah will tell you you are wrong. Allah will tell you to leave. Allah will tell you that what you are doing, it's causing inconvenience and disturbance to the Prophet wasallam. so don't do it again. <clears throat> and when you ask his wives, it goes further, for anything you want, ask them from behind a screen that is purer for your hearts and for their hearts. And it is not right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger, nor that you should ever marry his wives after him, that is after his death, verily with Allah. That shall be an enormity. That's a grave thing. A very, very grave thing to marry a wife of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after he passed away. Obviously, the first addresses were the sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So they were the ones who used to be invited. They were the ones who used to ask the wives of the Prophet for something. He's not home and they want to ask something about the Prophet, you know. So Allah gave all the laws of, as to how they should approach these things. As mentioned by the commentators, it states here, the above verse was revealed regarding an incident which occurred with the companions of the Prophet It is narrated from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala that when the Prophet married Zainab bin Jahash, he invited the command companions for a meal, that is with the walima. After having their meals, the companions remained seated and were talking to each other for some time. So you know, they just sat speaking in the house of the Prophet wasallam. They felt comfortable. Although it was time to leave, the companions were not leaving. 
So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam stood up and left the house. So he thinking that they will take a message from what he is doing. He stood up and he walked out of his house. Upon this, some companions stood up and also left. However, some remained sitting. They didn't take the message. They remained sitting, seated, speaking with each other. When the pro so the, after some time, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam thought that everybody would have left. So he returned. He went outside and he returned. But they were still there seated. They were still there. No, he was affected. He was affected. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam left again, again to teach them and to give them the message that you should get up and leave by now. And when he got up to leave, then the remaining people they left. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he left first. So he didn't look back and see whether they were going or not. And after that, he was informed. Anas went to inform him about that, to say to him that they left, and then he returned to his house. This conduct of some companions caused inconvenience to the Prophet ﷺ and his family, but due to his noble and gentle nature, the Prophet ﷺ did not say anything to the companions. He didn't say anything. Many times like that, he will withhold, he will, you know, he will bear it, he wouldn't say anything. Hence, to correct the situation and to give guidelines to the believers regarding etiquettes and social behavior, Allah revealed the above mentioned verse. How people should conduct themselves. In the verse, Allah instructed the companions and all believers in general, all you who believe, enter not the Prophet's houses unless permission is given. Okay, so it, it goes about teaching us beautiful conduct about entering other people's houses also. When we go there, what we do? When we are finished what we have been invited for, do we wait, do we hang around? You know, all these things are given under the commentary of this ayah. So we'll stop the inshallah, we'll continue next day. كل يوم على بعضها ليه دنيا الناس بتنسى يوم رجعها لربها ليه ضيع بين الأمان والأمين نفتكر خان